In the drawing room, a group of suspects gathered. The detective has solved the mystery. Ladies and gentlemen, the butler did it. <laughs> You'll never catch me. The butler darted to his getaway car. But what he didn't know is this is a Nissan sales event ad. Wait, what? And his car is no match for the detective's Nissan Rogue or its standard VC turbo engine. Save on one of your own at the Nissan Thrill of the Drive sales event. Get a low $2.99 per month lease on Rogue. Availability is limited. Shop your local Nissan store and NissanUSA.com today. For well-qualified customers subject to NMAC credit approval, take from new dealer stock. See dealer for financing details. $39.69 initial payment for 36 months on 2023 Rogue S all-wheel drive. Excludes tax, title, license, and $650 acquisition fee. Disposition fee due at lease end. Call 1-888-858-8319 for offer details. Ends 4 23 Progressive presents Adjusting to the Suburbs. I never really thought about tools until I bought a house in the suburbs. It's like this weird homeowner test if I need a tool for a project and don't have it. And my neighbor Ted loves to give me that look when I ask to borrow a pole saw. A year ago, I didn't even know pole saws existed. And now I gotta borrow one from Ted? What is happening? Anyway, when you save with Progressive by bundling your home and auto, that's the easy part of adjusting to the suburbs. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. I'm Justin. And I'm Jay. And together, we're Cryptids of the Corn podcast. We are where scientific and magical thinking combine. We take my background in biology. And my background in exploring the unknown. We cover everything from sea serpents, UFOs, Bigfoots, the paranormal. Sky creatures, land creatures, cavern creatures. So please join us at Cryptids of the Corn podcast. They've heard these strange since the 1800s when they started logging the area out. The first sighting of the Susskind Screamer was it walked on two legs and it had the head of a pig and it was covered with hair. Welcome to Bigfoot Society. In this episode, we talk to Matt Arner, Bigfoot researcher from Pennsylvania. Matt shares about the regional Bigfoot reports that are definitely stranger than fiction. What exactly is this pig-headed creature running through the Pennsylvania woods? And what happened to Matt that one day when the trees started shaking violently? Find out this and more on Bigfoot Society. All right, Bigfoot Society, thanks for coming back for another episode. I've got Mr. Matt Arner with me tonight. How's it going, Matt? It's going well tonight, so I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Uh, yeah, and uh, likewise, I'm excited to talk to you. You're out there uh, in uh, this northwest Pennsylvania, right? Well, I'm I'm actually, I live in the Poconos, which is northeast oh, Pennsylvania, yeah. but my base of operations is northwest pennsylvania we have a cabin out there um we do a lot of research out there it still hasn't been developed uh like the uh pennsylvania poconos uh, are uh so we still have some very very remote areas uh with um a lot of historical activity and uh some ongoing activity as well research area northwest uh you live out in the Poconos out there by Scranton and all that good stuff on the north. Absolutely. Uh, yep. Which is cool. Uh, so you're a Bigfoot researcher. Is there anything else that you would want the uh, audience to know about your yourself that will help lay the foundation as well? To really kind of give a, a, a good viewpoint of where I'm coming from. Um, I've worked 18, well, uh, 19 years with the, with the police department that I'm with now with another uh, two years prior experience. Um, I am a uh, detective. I'm uh, a certified crime scene technician. Uh, so I know about physical evidence. Um, I'm also very good with interviewing people and, and speaking with people. The truth detector really kind of goes on and off when I'm, when I'm talking to uh, uh, witnesses. The other thing too, that I really try to emphasize more is I am an outdoorsman. So uh, I grew up in the outdoors. Um, I, I spend quite a bit of time either out at my cabin uh, or in my hammock tent or bivouac uh, out in some of these wild areas. And uh, 
uh, it's been a blast. So I do what I really try to do is show people um, how to be safe uh, when they're going out to do Bigfoot research, especially in an area where there's no cell service. uh, The terrain is uh, is not very good. you know, there's other uh, risks involved, uh, such as uh, rattlesnakes where I go. Uh, they're all over the place. Uh, so letting people know about that kind of stuff, along with my training as a police officer, detective, um, I'm really, I'm kind of more uh, more of a bugger about safety and uh, pub, you know, keeping the public safe more than anything else. But um, in the same vein, also uh, getting out to these areas to do this research. That, that is is fascinating. You don't get too many times able to talk to, uh, especially, you know, people that are uh, police officers, uh, yep. detectives, and also in a Bigfoot. Usually you yes. talk to those guys after they're retired. And yes. then they're going to tell you all, all what's going on. Is there anything weird like, you know, when you came out, and your buddies started to find, okay, this guy's also the Bigfoot guy. Was there anything mm-hmm. like that or? You know, the, the, the funny thing was, was that I, I really started telling the guys uh, about 10 years ago. So I was still relatively not quite a rookie, but, you know, just between that rookie to uh, experienced officer stage and uh, it's still, uh, still up to get a lot of ribbing. And, uh, but I had that one, uh, a person that we worked with, he was actually with another agency and he pulled me aside and he says, Hey Matt, I really do believe in this stuff. And he never had an encounter, but he's kind of in the same boat where he heard so many, um, you know, witnesses, you know, talking about what they saw. And he said, this is compelling. You know, why are people putting their reputations out on the line stating that they're uh, that they saw something that should not exist, or mainstream science does not uh, does not believe exists, and uh, just from hearing that, that was kind of a boost of confidence with me. Now we still kept it quiet. I still don't really advertise about it, uh, but um, you know, some of the guys in the in the department, yeah, there's the one guy who keeps making fun of me, saying, "Oh, it's you know, you're, you know, Bigfoot's driving a car, Bigfoot's running away." Uh, but then I do have a few other guys that, you know, come to me and say, hey, you know what, um, you know, it's a good thing that you do on the weekends. It, one thing that I'll say, um, I didn't really want to get too much into the police work. But the one thing is, is uh, we just had um, an officer wellness training. And the one of the things that they emphasize is having a hobby outside of outside your work. So this does uh, and we'll go into it a little more about some of the things that I do that are kind of, you know, like what I do at at work. But at the same vein, I'm not thinking about work. So uh, having this as a hobby uh, actually helps um, in the long term, whether you're out there um, doing Bigfoot research, if you're out there just uh, just doing wildlife research, um, just being out there and, you know, disconnected, you know, is uh, just a a, a godsend uh, for our mental health as uh, in law enforcement, um, military, uh, other first responders, firefighters, EMTs. Uh, I've talked to several people in in that first responder community, in the military community. And again, uh, you know, being out there in the woods, there's no other cure for, you know, just kind of, you know, letting that stress go. I agree 100%. Uh, Everyone needs something to do outside of yes. their nine to five or you're going to go nuts. So Absolutely. I'm glad that I, I found that you found that. Um, and it, it's got to be uh, cool. You know, you're hopefully one day you'll be at the office and <clears throat> you'll get that weird uh, call in from someone. Hey, I, I saw something and you're yeah. like, I got this one, boys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it might happen, but. Uh, not in our our, our ears more urban um however okay. however i i did get a call one time for a possible mountain lion that was uh that was in our town so um i followed up with the interview i think it was a misidentification uh we do have uh, fairly large bobcats that are in the area but um 
it was still kind of neat to to do that. So that's awesome, Matt. Whenever I have someone on, I, I'm always curious to know uh, how you started to get into the whole uh, Bigfoot thing to begin with. So was it a sure. thing where you were a little kid getting into Bigfoot, or mm -hmm. how was what what brought you into it? Well, uh, the one thing is, is I've always had an interest in it. And um, my parents really didn't know. Uh, they, you know, I was the, the last of the, the siblings. So I kind of, you know, went off and did my own thing. But um, they knew I was into the outdoors and, you know, watching scary movies and stuff like that. But they didn't really know specifically about Bigfoot. Um, my, I grew up in a, in a Navy family. So, uh, you know, we were always connected with the bases and such. And I remember the one night we went out to the, uh, to the Navy base and they had a movie, you know, family movie night. Um, one of the movies was, um, the legend of Boggy Creek and the other movie, which I didn't know the name of it. I just, and I still kind of don't know the name of it, but uh, you'll know which one it is. Uh, the Ivan Marks movie uh, that he made about Cripple Foot, which was kind of, you know. But anyways, it was a, a very interesting film, and those films kind of got me into it. Um, when I was 10 years old, I actually, uh, we were given a class project of what, uh, you know, I think I was in like, I don't know, third or fourth grade what you want to do when you, when you grew up. And so I wrote this life story that I was going to be a park ranger, which isn't that far from what I'm doing right now. And that I would be looking for Bigfoot. And I actually had a picture of a Bigfoot. <laughs> so I still have a copy of that. It's on my, uh, it's on my personal Facebook page. I always put that up every so often, but I wrote this when I was, you know, 10 years old in 1982. Um, so anyways, um, you know, I did have that strong connection. Now where we lived, um, uh, we lived in, um, in, uh, like a Southeastern part of Pennsylvania. It's not a, what I thought was not a squatchy area. However, my mom was working a, like an, like a, um, not really an evening shift, but you know, she was going out from five to, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. to work at her uh, at her job. And on the way, um, and this was in the 1980s, I remember her coming back home almost immediately. This happened in the wintertime. And she told my, uh, she told all of this, but she went to my dad and said, I saw a monster uh, crossing the road out by the industrial park. So the way my mom described it, and I'll just give you a little thing about my mom. My mom was... She grew up in the coal mine area here in, in Pennsylvania. It's almost like you know, how you would envision like West Virginia um, in the hard coal areas. Um, uh, they were uh, always, you know, uh, just kind of, uh, I wouldn't say backwards, but they, uh, you, you didn't get the exposure to some of the things that you would have in the, in the cities. But um, she described the, the monster as she saw it as almost like a hippie like a like some hippie long-haired monster thing that that crossed the the road in about two steps um at first i was you know i was like yeah you know what you know come on dad let's go out there and he said no 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 you got to stay here i'm gonna drive out with your mom they went out they didn't find anything um but my mom is not one to lie about anything like this so the more I started, when I got older, you know, we always knew about the monster story. We would always tell her about it, you know, say, hey, tell me what you remember about the monster. Well, it looked like a hippie, you know, it looked like a, it looked like one of those rock people, you know, with the long, strictly hair and everything. Um, but the more I started looking into this is we were close to New Jersey. We were close to the Pine Barrens. And there have been historical sightings from the Pine Barrens. And from what I found out is that they would bleed over to Pennsylvania. So that was really kind of the, I guess, you know, I did have that momentum going. And this was just kind of the push to really kind of take, uh, get me into this. Now, again, this is in the 1980s. I'm still a young kid. I thought about, you know, Bigfoot, you know, when I was growing up, when I was in high school, college. Um, it wasn't until like the 1990s that the internet started, you know, really getting popular. And I would go on the old um, BFRO site. I'd go on uh, Eric Altman's 
uh, had uh, a wonderful setup with the uh, Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society at the time. And they always had the uh, the link. If you want to become an, um, an investigator, you know, send us an email. I always did. <clears throat> I never heard anything. Um, but um, I did find that there was a lot of uh, interesting uh, sightings that happened, uh, not only where where I had previous lived, or previously lived, but where I had moved up to in the Poconos. So as I'm going through, I'm finding that, you know, uh, they were seeing this, uh, you know, up in the uh, uh, you know, Monroe County, uh, in Luzerne County, in Schuylkill County. And I'm like, oh, my God, I live in these areas. You know, I, I know these areas pretty well. So around, I, and again, I still kind of kept interest and in, I'd watch the, you know, what, like, you know, any of the um, unexplained mysteries, you know, those, those type of shows. Um, but it wasn't until um, I had a friend of mine that started a paranormal group. They wanted to know if I wanted to go ghost hunting. Do you feel as a Bigfoot researcher, mm -hmm. what's the difference between researching Bigfoot in that area of time when there was hardly any internet as opposed to today where there's almost a overload of information. Yes. You don't know where to look because these reports could be anywhere. Yes. And like how is that – what's the, the difference there? That must be so interesting to, to live know, in both of those worlds. It, it, it was. And um, again, I really kind of got more into it towards the late 90s. Um, now, I love this person to death. <laughs> uh, he is the godfather of Pennsylvania research, Stan Gordon. But oh, like, yeah. if you go on like Stan Gordon's website, like, you know, like on some of the older websites, it's just like it was back in the 1990s, you know, and uh, I love the guy. He is, like I said, he is the godfather of Pennsylvania crypto and UFO research. He is he is uh, the man. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot Society. We'll be right back after these messages. Progressive presents Adjusting to the Suburbs. I never thought about space in my cramped apartment, but in this house, all I see is empty space. The sofa and ottoman look like tiny islands in a sea of hardwood floors. I could get two ottomans in the living room, but then I'd need another sofa. <gasps> I could tell people I'm into minimalism. Anyway, when you save with Progressive by bundling your home and auto, that's the easy part of adjusting to the suburbs. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. Ready to celebrate the dude that banished all the snakes from Ireland, allegedly? Well, you're going to need drinks. So get them all from Drizzly, the go-to app for alcohol delivery. With Drizzly, you can shop local stores and can compare prices on beer, wine, and spirits. Then get them all delivered in time for St. Patrick's Day. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com today. Must be 21 plus. Not available in all locations. In the drawing room, a group of suspects gathered. The detective has solved the mystery. Ladies and gentlemen, the butler did it. <laughs> You'll never catch me. The butler darted to his getaway car. But what he didn't know is this is a Nissan sales event ad. Wait, what? And his car is no match for the detective's Nissan Rogue or its standard VC turbo engine. Save on one of your own at the Nissan Thrill of the Drive sales event. Get a low $2.99 per month lease on Rogue. Availability is limited. Shop your local Nissan store and NissanUSA.com today. For well-qualified customers subject to NMAC credit approval, take from new dealer stock. See dealer for financing details. $39.69 initial payment for 36 months on 2023 Rogue S all-wheel drive. Excludes tax, title, license, and $650 acquisition fee. Disposition fee due at lease end. Call 1-888-858-8319 for offer details. Ends 4 But, yeah, it, you know, like I said, seeing, uh, you know, some of the sites, they were those old, uh, you know, where you, you just had the, you know, uh, the replies on there, almost like an old message board. Uh, you would just click on the reply you know, or click on the uh, you know, on the uh, link. It would take you to, you know, basically like a text um, blurb of what the sighting was. But, you know, back then we didn't know too much about, you know, what to do. And that kind of led me into what happened in the early 2000s before really the big explosion of um, Bigfooting really hit the internet. And we, again, we had no idea, you know, we weren't out there doing wood knocks, 
we heard them, you know, but we didn't really know that in other parts of the country that they were, you know, they were attributing, you know, these wood knocks to, you know, a, a possible, um, you know, wood ape, Bigfoot. Again, what we were looking for was mostly uh, just tracks, which in Pennsylvania is very hard to find because of the way the soil is. Just following up with sightings, uh, sighting reports. And on the occasional, uh, there was one time back in the early 2000s where we believe we found a nest, but we weren't, we really didn't have a whole lot of information at that time to really conclude what this was. In the early 2000s, then I got involved with the with the ghost hunting group. What they said was, hey, we're getting these reports of weird things happening in the uh, in the woods. And they knew that I was, you know, primarily, you know, I, I love to be outdoors. So I they said, hey, can you look into this? Absolutely. So there were quite a few times that we took the paranormal group out and uh, they would be out there with the EMF detectors and the, you know, but yet on the other hand, one thing that I learned from them was using uh, the use of uh, the voice recorders. And what they would do is they would have the voice recorders up, you know, with the parabolic mic listening for anything. And this is something that they brought from the paranormal side to the crypto, uh, cryptozoological side. So that in itself was uh, kind of like a breakthrough for me. I started reading more and more about, you know, different things that, that could be done. There were some things that I, I learned from work. Um, and uh, again, it just kind of went from there. Yes. Did you find there was a time when you get back home, you're going over your recorded audio and you picked up stuff that you hadn't heard um, at the time you were recording it? Yes. Um, at the time, I, I mean, there's some audio files that I, I, I wish I still had because uh, they were on other computers and such. But uh, there were times that we would sit there and I, I would tell them right off the bat, hey, uh, this is a pack of coyotes that are calling or, hey, this is a fox. Um, those are generally uh, what the uh, animals are that make uh, uh, sounds like that. Um, in the uh, Pennsylvania woods. But then there was a few times that, again, we would think that it, it may have been a fox, but then you get, uh, you, you just listen to the tone and the volume and the, um, you know, how it, 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 that call is being expressed. Um, and there's no way that, a you know, a 16, 17 pound fox is going to make that loud and that deep of a scream. Uh, there was also other um, uh, calls that we got, especially with the coyote calls, where we would sit there and I'd say, okay, this is a high, high pitched yip. This is definitely from a coyote. But then you would get that one call that uh, sometimes it's right before the, uh, the coyote call. Sometimes it's after the coyote call where uh, after a couple of years, what did we recognize it as an Ohio call? You know, where you would get that drawn out uh, uh, call uh, call being blasted through. There was, uh, you know, absolutely no way a, a coyote could have made that call. Um, not to say that they wouldn't, but um, again, once I heard the original Ohio call from uh, that Matt Moneymaker actually recorded, uh, I was like, oh, my God, this is exactly what we've been hearing. And this was in areas where we did have uh, historical sightings uh, here in uh, Pennsylvania. I, I would have loved to have been there when you made that realization when you were like heard Moneymakers yes. call from 94 and you're like, I've heard that call. That's, I've, yeah, exactly. Oh, man, that's great. It was it, it, just hearing that, like, you know, you yeah. still get kind of the shivers coming down your back. So, you know, I've heard other people talk about, you know, Bigfoot in relation to to coyote. Do you think there's some sort of like symbiotic, symbiotic. back and forth going on there, or is this? I, I it's hard to say. And the one thing is, is if we listen to uh, howls uh, that we record, um, I have some uh, long term uh, uh, digital recorders that are up on on a few of the mountainside research, and I'll listen to some of these calls. And again, we're looking, uh, we're listening to the pitch. Um, primarily, we're listening to the volume. We're listening to the output of that sound. Um, 
But when it comes down to it, a lot of people, um, even some experienced researchers, aren't that sure if it's a coyote, if it say it's a pack of coyotes, or if it may be a Bigfoot. Now, the reason I bring that up is if you do get a bunch of coyotes that are making a call, that sounds similar to an Ohio howl or any other vocalization, you may have another animal, you know, such as, such as a Bigfoot, um, making a return call, especially when these calls are made at three o'clock in the morning. So I think that's where a lot of that connection uh, between coyotes and Bigfoot uh, may come into play. Now, again, I I know there's other people that um, are more well versed uh, that would be able to to you know give their explanation that you know maybe they do travel together. But my thing is is that I think that 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 whether it's Bigfoot, um, Wood Ape, whatever you want to call it, is returning the call um, you know from those coyotes, thinking that it may be. Uh, another creature. Um, and again, if it's confused, uh, you know, some more experienced researchers where you really have to get down and, you know, send it out to the Olympus project, you know, because you don't know, you know, I would say that, you know, it's also the same with them. They may not understand that, you know, what, what's being called, they may be aware of the coyotes, but, you know, if you do get a coyote making a specific call, they may think that it's, one of you know another one of their uh, creatures calling to them. It's almost like we need to partner with some wildlife biologists yes. that are into the the coyote culture and and yes. bounce some stuff off. We need to find the guy or the gal who's into uh, wildlife biology, coyote research slash yes. also a bigfooter. That would be yes. fantastic. Absolutely, so absolutely. If you're out I know. There, if- let me know. I know a few hunters, a few coyote hunters that that know the coyotes very well. And if I can get one of them to come over on our side, that would be a win-win for us. Uh, mentor uh, with uh, Bigfooting is Sean Forker. Uh, Sean is a great friend of mine. I, I'm so glad that I met him. And uh, he has been my mentor through through. Uh, uh, you know, from the time that I met him and, you know, I know with him, we've talked about some cases where maybe it's not exactly a habituation case, but, um, the creature gets used to, or, uh, accustomed to coming onto a property. And there was one or two cases that he investigated, uh, not that far from, from my research area where, uh, they did have something uh, very similar to it, but the, the people weren't leaving anything there. Um, what the people were doing was uh, they were uh, leaving their trash out and, you know, they would put it in a dumpster that was that was bear proof, but something was still going in and, and getting this. And uh, they did end up seeing something at the dumpster, which prompted them to to contact uh, the PBS and, uh, and Sean. Again, you may get into those situations where, uh, you know, a creature does become a little more accustomed to, uh, to people than it should. Yeah. It's, it's definitely thing from what I've heard, you know, you want to be, you want to be careful if you're putting Mm -hmm. out food or leaving out garbage, because sometimes when you stop doing that, you can cause a situation where you've got a pretty angry creature. Absolutely. Even if it's not a Bigfoot, even if it's a bear, you're in a yes. world of trouble anyways. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And where I live, it, it, it's funny. We actually, uh, we have so many bears uh, around town. It's, uh, the bears even have their own Facebook page. So uh, we've had the bears come in, uh, come in my yard, uh, you know, even when we're still there. Uh, we know how to work with the bears. We know how to live with the bears. Uh, but now you're talking about uh, something that has, you know, Definitely a more intelligence in a bear, probably better senses because bears are basically blind. You know, they 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 don't see that well. They rely on their sense of smell uh, to uh, basically uh, lead them uh, on their way. But now you're looking at something that, even if we don't know the intelligence, we know that they have sharp eyesight. Um, you know, as for the uh, scent detection, I'm I'm not sure, but they're still, you know. 
aware you know you're talking about creatures that are if they do sense something like you know somebody's putting garbage out somebody's putting apples out somebody's putting bird feed out something that that they could eat they're going to come to it you know and uh it may not always, you know, I, I think the one thing, though, is that they have enough sense that they know to stay away uh, from towns. And uh, there's something about cameras, trail cams. They do not like trail cams. Um, in fact, a uh, funny story, if you don't mind me telling you, there was a guy that uh, had a, a Bigfoot sighting uh, not that far from my house. And he was not someone that wanted Bigfoot on his property. And uh, it really uh, shook him to the core when, uh, when he saw what he saw. Uh, I do believe what he saw was a Bigfoot. I don't believe it was a misidentification. Uh, we went out. Uh, he showed me uh, basically the branch uh, you know, that was uh, basically our, our, t- our, our size frame uh, for this creature. The creature, uh, we're not talking about a 10 foot tall beast, but we're talking somewhere between six and a half to seven feet tall. Um, and when he saw this again, it, it freaked him out. He did not want to want to go back to uh, that back area of the property. So I told him one thing. I said, you don't want Bigfoot around? Put up trail cameras everywhere. I said, put 40 trail cameras up. Nothing's going to come around. And he said that, you know, since he put that out there, he's heard vocalizations but he hasn't had anything come onto the property since he started doing that so again i don't know if the if it's anything from the infrared i don't know if it's anything from just hey you know what um you know i know these woods really well and now there's a plastic box on the tree i don't know what this does i'm just gonna stay away from it i don't know you know but it did seem to work Wow, and that's in northeast northeast Pennsylvania. This was in northeast. Yeah, this okay. is this wasn't that far from where I live. Wow. And uh, in fact, I I drive that area, and that's another area where um, historically has been a very active active area. Um, in fact, uh, we were just talking about it tonight on Facebook. Uh, somebody posted in a group about um, this particular stretch of road. And I said, well, uh, you know, and I'm not going to give away where this guy lives because he lived in a specific spot um, on, along this area. But there was a, a creature that for years was called the Suskin Screamer. And what the Suskin Screamer, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, basically in lore was uh, there was a big wooded area between Pittston and uh, Thornhurst which is in, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, middle of the Poconos, um, in that area, it's all wooded, it's all staking lands. And, uh, they would, uh, the, the lure goes was that it was a bride that was jilted on her wedding night and she decided to kill herself and she screams, but then you start reading into it and you start looking and doing a little more research. They've heard these streams since the 1800s when they started logging the area out. Um, along with that, uh, I guess the, the first sighting of the Suskin Screamer was, uh, it walked on two legs and it had the head of a pig and it was covered with hair. So what do you get with that? You know, and, uh, eventually the, the one story that I linked onto the Facebook group actually towards the end started saying that there were multiple, um sightings of a bipedal hairy object walking through there so this has been going on for a long time it's an active area um as for there being a lot of bigfoot around there i don't think so i i think there's so many different corridors and so many different places that it's probably just traveling through um and just happens to get sighted but it's definitely a corridor uh, for for something. It's just a matter of finding out, uh, you know, narrowing down when it happened, what time of year, what you know, time of uh, day these sightings were, and you know, trying to uh, see if you can get that sighting replicated. You know, through uh, you know, just uh, from observations, uh, just going out there, hiking, walking, uh, just passively uh, observing, and if you knew that they happened in. March or April, uh, you know, uh, 
that's when the bulk of the signings were throughout all these years. That's probably when you're gonna gonna have you know a possible encounter or probably uh, have better luck at finding something there. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot Society. We'll be right back after these messages. Tired of missing out on opportunities in your network? Frustrated because you've lost touch with people who matter. Clay helps you make the most of your personal and professional relationships. Clay pulls in everyone you know and keeps updated bios for them. Then you can search your whole network, take notes, set reminders, and more. We'll even prompt you to reconnect when you've lost touch with someone. Try Clay free for 60 days by visiting clay.earth slash partners slash 60. Suskin Screamer, that's that's really cool. Is Has that been written about in any books that you know of? Uh, it has been in, uh, you know, a few of the few of the books. If you Google Suskin Screamer, okay. uh, there's a few uh, articles. Uh, there may be a few uh, links to uh, to the books, but it is an interesting, uh, uh, you know, story. Again, they try to attribute it to, you know, more paranormal. But as you read more and more into it, it's starting to go, you know, it's starting to go into a possible crypto area. There. I like that, man. It's like, yeah, yeah that totally yeah. sounds like a Bigfoot. Yeah, another, definitely. Another thing I wanted to ask you while we're yep. in Northeast Pennsylvania, and if this is like a hoax or something, then, yeah. you know, just excuse my lack of knowledge of the area. But yeah, I, I always hear this story about Northeast Pennsylvania has a white Bigfoot or a sighting of a white Bigfoot. Is that a thing or is that just some no, they, hearsay I heard? There, It's not hearsay. Okay. Um, whether it's a hoax or not, I'm not sure. Um, it was cited up in Carbondale, uh, Pennsylvania, wow. and uh, which is uh, north of Scranton. And uh, with Carbondale, I guess it was an apartment complex that was uh, adjacent to the woods. They were somebody had seen uh, this thing. There was police officers that went out. I don't know if it was the police officer themselves or um, one of the witnesses that came out and actually videotaped, um, you know, what they believe to be a, a white Bigfoot. Um, I'm a little up in the air on what it is. You know, uh, could it be a person in a mask? Absolutely. Um, did they make masks like that back then? Because uh, I think it was late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, it may have even been earlier than that. I'm not sure, but I don't know. I'm I'm just, I'm kind of on the fence on that one. But there were sightings of, of a white Bigfoot. And there's no reason why I think that Bigfoot can't have different colorations. Um, you don't hear about them being all black. You know, you might get one that's brown. You might get one that's tan. It, it's uh, just like you'd have with bears. Uh, bears, People say the Pennsylvania, well, uh, the American black bear, you know, I consider it the Pennsylvania black bear, but, um, you know, that they're all black for the majority of them. 99% are going to are going to be black, but they may have white on the crest or or they may have a, a, a red or a brown edge of the uh, where the, uh, the hair is, uh, which gives them a different color. You may also have, again, uh, we've seen uh, the black bears with other other colors, uh, colorization. So you're talking about something where you have a specific genetic pool um, that's feeding into it. Now, again, if you have something like a Bigfoot or a North American wood ape, you're going to have a spread of, you know, possibly different colors there. So I think white is kind of a... Uh, uh, you know, a very, very uncommon color, but it hasn't been, uh, there's been other signs of white Bigfoot uh, throughout the country. So um, I, I think that if we look into the fact that that Bigfoot is, uh, uh, you know, a creature that, that does exist, there's the possibility that they have different uh, colorizations like that. So um, you know, like I said, uh, there's so many witnesses that brought about the white, uh, Bigfoot or the brown Bigfoot, the tan Bigfoot. So uh, I don't think the colorizations are really that much into play. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's definitely different uh, variants of color. Um, I talk to so, I've talked to so many Bigfoot witnesses mm -hmm. every day. I'm I am convinced, and I I will. I don't usually take a stand on on stuff. But I'll, I'm going to take a stand on this because I've talked to so many people daily in the last three months, 
as I'm trying to get more witnesses to talk on here, it takes a lot of conversations to get to that point. It does. There are so many reports from across the nation, all different areas where the person always says the creature looked reddish brown. And that's weird because it's not red. It's not brown. It's everyone is saying – most people are saying reddish brown. I'm like, that's weird. People keep saying that specific color. It's yes. just, it's the weirdest thing, Matt. So I it don't know, is. something I've noticed as I've started to talk to witnesses a lot. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, the one my mom talked to, uh, talked about seeing, that was – black you yeah. know that was she said that it had that black greasy stringy hair uh but other people i talked to it, have said that they've seen you know uh it, not so much black but like a brown uh, mm. and that that was really something that that kind of kind of caught their eye uh was the uh was the color of the hair very so, interesting yeah absolutely you mentioned you know we have a, a mutual friend uh sean forker it's a great guy. Oh my god, yes. I've been able to talk to him before. It was, it was a fun chat. And there's got to be a, a story, a fun story about how you guys initially met in like is there some like Matt and Sean's crazy Bigfoot adventure story <sighs> that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. there there is. There is. So um this is I I I must preface this where um, the intro story to Matt and Sean is actually going to be in print in, in, in uh, one way or another, not for okay. me. So, okay. hint, hint. Um, but anyway, so what happened was uh, years ago, 2013 uh, was when I first met uh, Sean. So what happened was I went to the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society's uh, fall, uh, you know, get together. And it was in uh, Clearfield County, uh, Parker Dam State Park, which Parker Dam has, uh, uh, that's an area of, again, higher significant activity. They had historical activity there. They were having current activity uh, in, in that area. Um, this was not, this was literally like 10 minutes away from where Sean had his encounter, uh, the, the, the bad encounter. So Sean had made it out there with his with his friends, and uh, I don't know anybody here. You know, everyone's mostly uh, you know from Western PA or New York, and I had no idea who who any of these people were. I talked to them on the computers, but that was about it. I, I I was just there, just have a good time. So I'm walking around trying to trying to talk to these people, and I see this uh, I see this little guy come up to me, and he says. Hey, I'm, my name's Sean. What's your name? And I said, my name's Matt. And that was the start of a wonderful, long friendship with him. And, uh, and it, him and his group were so accepting of me, uh, you know, just, you know, coming in there, being the first time, you know, going to one, one of these uh, major outings uh, with the PBS. And we just, uh, you know, I mean, we just all clicked. Now, there was a bad story about this. Uh, which Sean will talk about. He may have already said something. It was called the March, uh, uh, the Death March. So, myself and Dustin, one of uh, one of Sean's friends, um, who have the the uh, the mapping experience, the orienteering experience, uh, we said, "Hey, we're going to take this walk. It's just going to be a short out and back, and this is going to be great. You know, we'll 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 take the the group." Well, it didn't turn out that way. And a short three mile hike turned into like a 10 mile hike. And yeah, it was like up and down rocks and, you know, uh, going through beaver swamps and in creeks and everything. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, man, I hope I hope these guys still talk to me after this is done. But anyways, I, I will say that I, I took, uh, you know, we did about 50 percent, you know, me and Dustin between uh you know or uh credit for uh you know misleading them slightly but uh, again the, the map system wasn't that great this is before gps you know like we had gps but not the phone gps is like you do now and um so anyways later that night uh we decided to go out to the clearing which is where sean had his encounter um one thing that i did was before i went out there i put up a trail camera 
pointing at the parking lot. And the reason I did that wasn't so much to see if uh, we have a Bigfoot that, that comes through the parking lot, but it's basically to keep track of the people that were coming back and forth into that area. Um, this was the only way in uh, to this area other than uh, for uh, going through a really thick, uh, heavily wooded forest. Towards, uh, you know, we were sitting there, we had a bonfire going, we're, we're having a blast. And around 11 o'clock, we had Eric Altman and uh, a few others that, that, that came in and they're out there making calls and doing wood knocks and everything else. But everyone's just having a great time. So they leave. And we're just sitting around the camp, uh, around the fire. Now, we weren't going to spend the night out there, you know, because of the, the experience that happened uh, previously with Sean. But we wanted to be out there a little bit. So I'm out there, uh, you know, talking to talking to Sean and the rest of the crew. And we said, eh, you know what, let's let's start heading back. So uh, we decided, that, you know, we we're going to slowly put out the fire. So we're sitting there putting out the fire. And then all of a sudden, from just right outside the wood line. <coughs> we get this solid whoop and that there, it was funny because me and Dustin, well, Dustin, Dustin's a great guy. I love Dustin to death. He, he is, he is like my mini persona, you know, like him and I like, we we're like, yeah, you know, we, we got something. Sean and his other friends here were like, um, we got to go. <laughs> I'm like, all right, you know, so, uh, but that was just such an incredible experience. That whoop that we heard, uh, it was clear, concise. It was loud. Um, there was, uh, you know, it, there's certain owls that, that can make, you know, calls that are not really similar, but, you know, you, you hear a who or, but this was a solid whoop, like you would hear from a Gibbons, except, if it was a Gibbons that was, you know, 400 pounds, uh, just because of that, you know, that power that went through it. Um, so, uh, it, that was, uh, that was our exciting, uh, uh, first experience, first shared experience I had with Sean. And, uh, ever since then, we've been very close friends. Again, he is my mentor, you know, like I, I, I've learned so much from Sean, um, and, uh, you know, uh, he really is a, a, a great guy. I can't talk highly enough about him. So, uh, you know, we always, always have good times, uh, uh, when we, uh, when we go out to do research. Absolutely. He's got a, they've got a good podcast going too. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Sasquatch experience, right? Yes. Yep. Yes. Everyone go check that out. If you're listening to this one, go check to that, go check that one out. Yes. Um, uh, that's a, that's a fun, uh, that's a fun beginning story for you guys uh that that was that was a good one that was a good one that that was excellent and of course you know part of it, i hate to say this but you know part of it was you know of course afterwards we we all went to uh a, a restaurant i think it's called uh over the mountain it's in rockton pennsylvania great food by the way and they're still open but uh we went there for, they were doing sasquatch talks there they actually had a like a like a big cutout sasquatch because they knew about the activity up there and uh you know they didn't really commercialize on it like you know but it, it was just really cool to be up there so every time me and sean go out we always make sure that we have a good restaurant to go to nearby i'm uh, uh, the two of us are always scouting out places so i love that you should yes <laughs> should have yep. a, a bigfoot uh, restaurant book of Pennsylvania. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a lot better than eating mountain house. So, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When you are going out, Matt, and you're looking for Bigfoot, what is it you're expecting to see? What kind of creature do you, or do you have anything in your mind that you're looking for? Uh, that's, that's tough to say because I've, I've talked to some really hardcore researchers and I, I, I don't know, you know, because I've talked to a couple people that have been, they've had sightings and they kind of were let down um, in a way from the sighting um, in the fact that they saw something, they didn't think it was a Bigfoot. And then five minutes later, 10 minutes later, they're like, no, wait, who was just walking on top of that cliff where there's no trail and the person's all in black and it's, you know, 95 degrees out, you know? Um, so, you know, like, I'm, uh, you know, something like that, eh, you know, it, it kind of, 
messes with your expectations because when you think about you know going out and seeing a bigfoot you always think of you know you you walk you get that face to face you know you 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 get to see the lines in the face you get to see the the structure of the body and everything and you know like i said from some very good researchers i've i've talked with they're like I saw something out there. <laughs> I think it was a Bigfoot, but you know, it's, uh, I didn't know it at the time, you know, and it, it's funny because it, it, like, you know, one person I talked to said, if I would have my camera up, I would have gotten a picture. And at least it may have been a blob squatch, you know, when it came out on video, but at least you would be able to see some sort of motion, uh, from, uh, from uh, the creature that they were looking at or what they were looking at. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot society. We'll be right back after these messages. Um, and when you look at, uh, you know, again, something that's bipedal, we don't all walk the same, you know, if you have something that, that walks differently, you know, it, it, um, it would be a lot easier to, you know, to bring forth to the Bigfoot community. Um, if you have something that's, uh, you know, a little different, uh, you know, in walking pattern or in just the way that, that it acts, you know, even if, you know, again, even if it is a blob squatch, but, you know, um, but as for me, what I'm think I, I'm trying to, you know, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see something close up or I'd like to see it enough that I could, I could see what the face looks like. Um, I've heard so many differences about the face. You know, uh, some people say it looks more human. Other people say it looks more like an ape. Um, other people bring up, you know, and, and I'm a big, um, proponent of this as well is I think a lot of dogman sightings may be misconstrued as possible Bigfoot sightings as well. Um, the one I think of the most where it could go kind of either way is, um, and I just uh, put it up on my Twitter page not that long ago, was uh, the Beast of Seven Shoots, um, where you look at it and it looks almost like a baboon face. Uh, you know, although it's not a clear, clear picture, but you could see, you know, the figure there and you can kind of see some shadows around the face, but it, it, it may be more of a, uh, just a super flat nose, a super flat, uh, um, you know, uh, facial area. Uh, but then I've talked to other people that said, no, they, you know, they have a nose like, our, you know, maybe just, you know, a little flatter than ours and, you know, they, they thought that, you know, they were just hairy people, you know, walking around. So I don't know, you know, I, my, my mind is open, um, you know, and uh, I can't say I'm looking for one particular thing. I would like to see that face out. That, that's the biggest thing I'd like to see. What do you think the closest you've gotten to, to one of these guys is? So I, I've had two experiences that were, that were fairly close. Um so the one, and I'll plug your your uh, your uh, group page, um, uh, Jeremiah. The name of the the page itself is the Bigfoot Society um, group uh, uh, encounters page, I believe. Well, okay. So I have yeah. two. So I have Bigfoot Society listeners. That's the public yes. one, and then I have Bigfoot Sasquatch Encounters, which is yes. like this private Facebook group but people can see it yes and i don't let anyone in there unless like i screen everyone so no yes. one is in there unless they have had something they yes. had something happen so everyone in there is in there for a reason and it's a yes. really cool community so far it is it is an awesome awesome community and the reason i brought that up is we had the um uh it, you had the question about how close someone has gotten i said i said i will tell you if you listen uh, to the podcast, so <laughs> you did, yeah. I did, I did. So <laughs> it was an interesting, this is probably the closest I've gotten. And I, I um, put it down in my, my encounters. Um, my wife and I, we weren't Bigfoot hunting. Uh, we were, we went up to Elk County at the time we were renting uh, cabins in the area um, uh, until we found the uh, place of our own. So we had been staying at a place um, that, that, is uh, they rent cabins. They're kind of scattered throughout the property. They're in a very um, uh, unique area. So no one could drive back there. You have to uh, load up all your luggage in, on a cart and uh, walk it back about a half a mile. So where it is, it's, it's fairly remote. And again, that area up there, 
it's when I say remote, it's remote like you would find out in the maybe not the West Coast, but it's one of the most remote remote parts in uh, at least the Mid Atlantic area outside of Maine. So um, we had this cabin. My wife and I, uh, uh, you know, we're spending uh, two nights there. First night, nothing happened. Second night, uh, we're in bed. The bedroom was uh, right up along a pathway. We were the very last cab, and, and there was a pathway that led back to uh, the creek, which led up to uh, Medic's Run, uh, which is uh, um, a big hollow in uh, in the uh, Benazette area. So around 3 o'clock in the morning, we both woke up, and we heard crunch, 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 something walking on that gravel. And you could tell... Just from the the pattern of the way it was walking, it was walking similar to a human. Um, Again, it's three o'clock in the morning. Who's going to be out there? There was no other cabins that were rented in our area. Um, So we were alone back there and we heard this crunch. And and you can also tell the difference between that and an elk. Uh, When elk come through, uh, because they have the the four, um, you know, uh, hooves there, there's... uh, you, you'd get a different sound, a different rhythm, a different pattern. This sounded like somebody with, we were, we were sitting here, we heard the crunches and unfortunately the window, and it's going to be hard to explain to the listeners, but um, I'll do my best. The window, you couldn't look out the window. Um, the window had uh, metal like uh, slats coming down that were at an angle. So you could see like, if you, went underneath and looked up you could look you know and see up but you really couldn't see straight out um there was a small light that was uh, uh you know on the other side of the path uh, and it wasn't a very powerful light just enough so that if anyone you know was outside you they would you know uh just have enough light just to you know uh, get to the path um as we were sitting there something blocked that light out and it blocked the light out, but it was relatively quick, you know, when it, when it blocked it out. I mean, it, the, whole, the whole window went black, but if it was an elk, it would have, you know, we would have probably had a little more shade or it would have been half because of how high this was. This was just like a flat, like something, you know, rectangular coming by. That just, you know, standing up, you know, rectangular, not, you know, long ways, but um, vertically that just went past the window. And then in all that time, then we were still hearing the crunches. Now, I didn't go outside at the time. I wish I did. Um, And I'll go into that's a whole nother point in the conversation at some later point in time. But um, that there we don't know what it was. But at the time. Um, again, we're close to, uh, actually not that far from Parker Dam State Park, which is where, where, uh, Sean had the encounter first, where we uh, heard the whoop. Um, there was also an area called Medic's Run and the locals were calling their local Bigfoot Medic's Run Mike. So, um, it was just a local thing. They didn't really publicize it at all. They didn't really push it at all, but, the locals knew, you know, whatever was coming down as medics run Mike, they called them, they, they named them. So I think with that, it, it, honestly, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about something where I was inside a building, but uh, if I had that window open, I probably could have, I'm a big guy too. I'm, you know, a six foot four. I could have reached my arm out and probably touched him, you know, as he walked uh, past because the, the path really wasn't all that wide, but whatever it was, was walking on that. On, on that path could have been anything i don't know you know like i said it, we're just uh basically coming up with some circumstantial points here that it could have been something that we you know that we haven't discovered yet um the second time where we were very close um i was doing a a more formal expedition uh with uh, a few friends of mine and um, one of them, and I'll give her, if you don't want, I'll give her a shout out, uh, Gwendolyn Purcell. Uh, and she has been also another another really good good person to work with. But this is the first time I met Gwendolyn. We were up in the uh, Allegheny National Forest. And again, we were part of basically more of a formal investigation. There was probably about 20 of us that were out that night. Um, 
we were out um, and a little road that was uh, that we had a gas well uh, adjacent to us. So uh, the uh, trucks would have to come up this hill and uh, and hit the gas well. Um, there was another road that went uh, parallel to us. And then down the road, there was uh, that was where our base camp was. Well, everything kind of all happened at once where all of a sudden we weren't hearing anything. We were just kind of sitting there hanging out, playing with the thermal. And um, all of a sudden we get a radio call from the base camp, which was eh, about a quarter of a mile down the road that something came up outside of the, the wood line made a growling noise and then they heard the they heard the uh uh the footsteps going away as soon as we had turned the radio off we heard three wood knocks well right after that and they were clear boom 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 then after that we heard the footfalls coming up basically right in front of us the only problem though was that this was in october so you still had heavy vegetation especially along roadways and we could not we knew something was back there we just couldn't tell what it was um we got to the point kind of after the fact where i i just looked at gwen and i i looked at uh the other guy that was with us i said i'm going back there you know <laughs> let me see what's back there and whatever was back there was long gone so um, but again, hearing those wood knocks, um, that was really something that, uh, it, that, you know, really, uh, I, I think with that, it, we're talking about distance where it may have been within 20 yards of us, um, with us being outside, I thought that was, uh, that was as close as we could get. If it was a daytime encounter, we would have seen this thing, you know, for sure. But, uh, being that it was nighttime, uh, you know, again, we had the thermal, we knew something was there, but we just couldn't get, a a fix on it because of that heavy vegetation. It, it, it kind of, um, you know, brought down the, the experience just a hair, you know, but it was still an exciting experience to get through. Um, I did have another experience a few weeks later um, in the ANF where it was a little farther away, maybe, you know, about 70 yards. Um, and that in itself was a, was a, it was a great encounter. It could have been anything. Again, it, it, there are so many things it could have been, but again, if you look at things in a circumstantial way, it may lead you to, okay, this is something that we don't know about. So what happened was a few weeks later, after we did the formal um, uh, you know, expedition up there, we decided to do an informal expedition. So I ran at the same cabin. Uh, now this is outside of the Benazet. This is up in the a &F. Ran at the same cabin I was at before. It was most of the, most of the same people, and uh, the only thing that was that the weather was kind of crappy that weekend. So I had been scouting around a new area between uh, the town of Kane and the town and the city of Bradford. Um, those area uh, those areas up there are again very remote, um, very hard to to, to get around. Um, I found a, what we call a primitive camp spot, and uh, these are scattered throughout the uh, Allegheny National Forest. Um, you, can, you can go there, camp there uh, for a few nights and, and go. You don't have to pay anything. So I had uh, just parked at this one. I didn't see uh, anyone out there, and there was a small trail that uh, went uh, along a creek. So as I'm going up along the trail... I end up finding a print and wouldn't you know, this print is about 16 inches long, about five inches wide. And it, what it did was it went basically diagonal across the, uh, across the uh, trail down towards the, uh, the Creek. So I'm like, Oh my God, I got it. Uh, this is, this is awesome. So the one thing I did that I, I, I I'll say was good was I went and I put, uh, a little stick there, you know, basically like Emily LaFleur does those flags it's similar, it's similar to that, except I'm, I don't have the flag. I, I just had a stick with a, with a leaf on it. <laughs> so I kind of figured out where it was, marked it. And then uh, uh, I went back to uh, my truck and I said, all right, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Can I get into town and get uh plaster? 
Stay tuned for more Bigfoot Society. We'll be right back after these messages. Well, the hardware store closed at 4 o'clock. So I ended up going the next day. And the next day, I, it was funny because one thing I always remember was um, I get up and um, and there was a song that was playing on the radio that, that just kind of has nothing to do with Bigfoot. But um, uh, it, it was just kind of a it, like just like a neat little song. And it was uh, Tom T. Hall's I Wash My Face in the Morning Dew, which is kind of like a, you know, like a folksy type song. I remember listening to that, driving to Kane at like, you know, nine o'clock in the morning after I checked out uh, and the song was playing on my uh, on my serious radio because that's the only radio you get up there. And I get into Kane, I get plaster, I get a bucket. I go back to the spot. There's no one around. Um, the day before it was loaded with hunters. It was a Sunday. There was no one because you couldn't hunt that Sunday. So I get up there and I, you know, uh, go back up to where the print was. Unfortunately, it rained the night before. So the print degraded. And what I should have done now thinking in hindsight was I should have covered it. Um, even if I had like a plastic box, something that I could cover to make sure that that, uh, that print didn't degrade as much as it did. But it was still enough there that I can, I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to cast it. It's, very hard to find prints in Pennsylvania in the first place. So I, I'm just casting it. So I go up, mixed it, cast it. I walk back down, uh, back down to my truck. So I'm sitting there. And again, there's no cell service. So I, I'm just looking, I'm kind of a map nerd. So I'm looking at maps. I'm looking to see where I'm at and, you know, doing all that stuff. And all of a sudden I hear something and I look in about 70 yards Along the roadway, I see this tree shaking. And when I see this tree shaking, um, I the way I described it was if, like, you know, for people growing up in the 1990s, um, they would have those contests where you'd go into, a, like, a phone booth and all the, the dollar bills would be flying around. And you'd have to catch them. I don't know if you remember anything like that, but, you know, like those, like, big money booth things. That's how violent this tree was being shook that the, that the leaves were just coming down. Like almost like it was raining. All the other trees were fine. This was being shook, but I didn't see anything there. So the one thing, and, and again, there's things that you do in hindsight and, and I'll, I'll go after, I'll go over this at the end here. I didn't do, which I should have done was I should have taken my phone out immediately. And I didn't, I was just so in shock like what the heck is going on and so i'm sitting here i'm like okay so i finally put the the uh video camera on but it stopped i don't know where whatever was there uh it went so i'm sitting there and, and the one thing i learned as a police officer which you know hopefully it would serve its purpose to to other people as well is if you run into whether it's bigfoot if it's uh, a wild animal Anything like that, what you want to do is you want to try to remain calm, and you also want to try to talk to it too. You know, I've I've had pit bulls like you know uh, running at me, and I'll sit there and say, "Listen, I don't want to hurt you." And that was one thing I said. You know, was, "Hey, I'm just here for research. I don't have any sort of weapons on me. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just here for research." You know. You can come up, if you come up, I'll get your picture. I might take a hair off you. I don't know, you know, but I'm sitting here trying to talk and, and stay calm. So that really didn't help all that much, but I did my best. And, and I, I did kind of, you know, I kept my heartbeat, you know, a little lower than it would have been. But I was like, all right, you know what? It's only been about 20 minutes, but I'm going up. I'm getting that cast. I'm getting out of here. So I go up and it's up the trail a little bit, grabbed the cast, um, brought it back. I didn't even clean. I figured I'll clean it when I get back to the house. So I get in the truck and I go over to the area where the uh, tree was. And I documented this, that where the tree was, there was about a seven foot ditch. 
and what it was was this was created probably back in the in the logging days or or maybe with the uh you know conservation corps days as basically a water runoff ditch um that was down this mountain there was this ditch that and unfortunately it was all rock at the bottom of it but something could have been down in that ditch shaking the base of the tree without me knowing it the one thing is, is that this was during the rut uh, for deer. But if it, I had seen, if it was during the rut and you had a buck that was going up there to do this, you would see that buck. You know, whatever was doing this was shaking it very violently, but also keeping itself hidden. And it may have thought that I did have a weapon. It may have thought that I... I may not have had, you know, the best intentions, but whatever it was, um, did not make itself known. And so again, I, I'm kind of, it could have been a deer that maybe was down there and was just shaking it. I don't know. It was just coincidental that we found the print in that same area. And it was a relatively fresh print. That, that print was when I saw it on Saturday, I collected it on Sunday. When I saw it on Saturday, that print had to have been uh, at least you know, or at the most 48 hours, because again, there was no degradation. I, I actually saw toe prints in it. Um, so again, this was just something that uh, really kind of, you know, uh, made me think that uh, this could be anything up there, you know, and, uh, and it was really a, a, a good encounter. It was a good learning encounter for me as well. Um, the one thing that I want to bring up that I said I, I talked about at the end was the whole uh, using your camera. Um, again, I'm trained as a police officer. So the one thing that I am trained for is, um, you know, uh, the use of my firearm. Uh, I could go in. We have what uh, what are called, you know, uh, well, we have the locking holster. So. Um, there's specific movements I have to make to release the, the gun from the holster. And we're trained that, okay, if we see something, I can get my gun out of that holster, making uh, two or three different maneuvers within, you know, like a fraction of, of a second, you know, basically like half a second, uh, at the most. One thing Bigfoot researchers need to do is to, uh, like I practice with the firearm, don't practice with the farm. Please don't do that. <laughs> but what you need to do, because uh, I've learned from this and, and I learned the hard way, is learn to get that camera out, get that camera on video ASAP. Even if you just sit there like we did, you know, like we would have blue guns that we'd have in our holster and snap, snap, click up. Take your phone and if it's on your uh, in a pocket, if it's uh, um, you know in your hand, get a practice to to having it up and turning it on. I think you know even having a, a button there, you know that that you can automatically get it uh, get that camera up and recording would be fantastic. We have to learn to do this because some of these encounters happen with such uh, with uh, within a, a few seconds. So if you're able to get your phone out. Get that phone on record, you know, then at least you you have something. And the one thing that that I'm really kind of upset at is I wish that I would have, you know, grabbed that camera when that tree was shaking. Uh, and the, the other thing, too, is there may be something that your eyes won't see that may be on that camera. Um, you could sit there and put the camera out, have it on. Your eyes are looking at maybe the top of the tree. You're looking at the leaves coming down. You go to look at that later on, and you're going to see, okay, was there an antler that was around the base of the tree? Was there a hand that was at the base of a tree? Was it something else? You know, could a, a wild squirrel may have decided to, to come in and, and cause some chaos? Probably not, you know, because it's not going to make the, the leaves all fall down like that. But again, your eyes may be fixated on one particular part of that you have that video going and you may be able to see you know even something leaving you know through that ditch or uh you know uh uh you know 
going, you know, laying down, you may not see that with your eyes, but you will catch that with that camera. Yeah, I think that's that is great advice uh, with having the camera ready or being able to get it ready. It reminds me of like what the NAWAC guys are doing now, where they have the cameras ready at a second's notice where they can just fire off and, yes. and get tons of different uh, photos. I mean, that's that's how we're going to get the evidence is exactly being ready to take the video or or the photos for sure. Exactly. So, uh, you know, it's it's those type of encounters that really make you think. And uh, and again, it, it's something that um, you learn from. So, uh, you know, for any of the researchers are out there, you know, get used to, to working with that, you know, getting that phone out, getting that picture. Um, and uh, it will, uh, you know, maybe from that, you know, we may be able to get, you know, something better, you know, than than what we've ever had before. So, um you know, even uh, Matt Moneymaker talks about dash cams on, on cars. Mm, yeah. uh, it, it's not such a bad idea. It, um, first, you know, it, from my perspective, it helps out. Like if you get hit, if you get into a car accident or anything, you know, on, on that side. But then on this side, you know, like I said, you, you have something that runs out in front of you. You don't know what it is. You know, hey, you know what? I can I can go to the next pull off slow it down. Okay. You know, Hey, you know what? It was just a bear that was, that was just running, you know, uh, it just like, you know, all out, you know, across the, uh, across the road or, okay. Uh, it's not a bear because I see long arms, you know? And so it's really, uh, you know, having something like that, again, our eyes fixate on one thing and having a camera like that or, or taking photos like that with either photos or video allow you to see those things that your eyes aren't immediately showing you. Mm. Yeah, and want to also mention you've had some really, really interesting things happen. I man, you had some definitely close calls. Uh yep. thank you for for sharing those. Yeah. Yep. How yeah, you know, I wanted to ask uh and bring up you've got some you've got some other uh things going on right now i mean you've got uh like uh can you talk about uh cryptic wilderness for a little bit sure started, absolutely what you do with that and all that good stuff absolutely i mean i don't i don't do a lot with it right now uh but i am i i have them in place and i have been putting stuff out there um i i do have cryptic wilderness on twitter and also on Facebook, and I just started a YouTube page. If you go to the YouTube page and look up Cryptic Wilderness, um, it actually, I, I actually have the, basically the aftermath of uh, the Allegheny National Forest incident. Um, I talk about an incident I had up at the, uh, uh, up at uh, my old hunting camp in uh, Clinton County. And um, so it really is interesting. I true try, I, I try to, have uh, the original intent was to talk about all sorts of lore, um, whether it was paranormal, crypto, with the emphasis on crypto, um, even just some legends, local legends from the area. But it really kind of evolved into cryptozoological, you know, specifically Bigfoot. Um, and what I also do too is I also talk a lot about nature in itself, um, you know, being in the outdoors what you need to do to, to prep to be in the outdoors. So it's things like that, that I do try to uh, get out and I'll be doing a few more videos um, in the near future. One of the one that I want to, to show was about using your iPhone um, or your cell phone as a GPS uh, using some of the uh, different programs out there. I've used that. Um, I've been in some pretty uh, remote areas here in PA Nothing like out west, but you know it, there are still places where again there's no cell phone service. Um, you're you're miles and miles away from help, but having that uh, you know on your phone could save your life. So it's little things like that that I try to you know kind of push when I'm going through. I also talk a lot about nature too because again, um, there may be uh, signs of uh, animal scat. Uh, well you know, Bigfoots have to poop too, you know, <laughs> and I know that's, a, a, that's probably going to be the title of this, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the one thing is, is that, is that, you know, there's differences between bear poop 
um, coyote poop, uh, regular uh, domestic dog. Um, there's differences in the tracks. So being able to, you know, kind of eyeball something, don't touch it. But being able to eyeball it and kind of get an idea uh, will help the, uh, you know, will help the uh, researcher uh, in uh, determining whether this is something that, you know, may need to be collected or something just to pass on, you know, pass by. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot Society. We'll be right back after these messages. So that's where I really do try to get a, a push in. Um, with the pages themselves, I'm not looking for any sort of notoriety. I'm not looking for any sort of, uh, you know, uh, get my name out there. It, it's basically, uh, you know, education. You know, it's uh, one person that I, I haven't met, but is definitely another mentor uh, for me would be like Dr. Russ Jones. Oh, you know, yeah. where. Totally. Yeah, where he's a naturalist, you know, now he has his job as a chiropractor, but uh, as a doctor, but, um, you know, he does this, you know, he he knows, you know, uh, the natural world there in, in West Virginia, like the back of his hand. He he really tries to emphasize, um, you know, being out there, uh, being out there safe. And uh, so, again, I, I, I do try to kind of you know, more or less be in that type of vein where I, I'm not, again, not looking just to put a name out there, but to to help people, um, help, uh, you know, future researchers, help even current researchers uh, that are out there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll, I'll definitely have uh, the links to that in the show notes. People want to go over and subscribe to the YouTube channel and watch the videos that have to do with what we talked about uh, tonight yes. and kind of flesh that out a little bit. That'd be awesome. Yeah. But Matt, this has been a super fun uh, discussion tonight in the chat with you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been really, really, uh, I've learned a lot about Pennsylvania. Wonderful. Uh, more than I knew. I grew up in Western Mass, but uh, I didn't know a lot about Pennsylvania, but uh, thank you so much for coming on. Be uh, do you mind taking a few minutes if there's anything else that uh, you want to make sure uh, people know that you've yeah. got coming up? Uh, please take a, a few minutes to to share how people can keep up to date with you. OK, uh, definitely. Uh, let me go to the, uh, <laughs> the Facebook page here. Uh, they can follow me on uh, it, they can follow me on Twitter under Cryptic Wilds. Uh, which is Cryptic Wilderness. If you type in that, uh, that will get you there. Cryptic Wilderness on Facebook, uh, Cryptic Wilderness on YouTube. Now, again, I've been, I haven't been on as much, but I do try to uh, get on there. Um, in August 12th, I will be at the Central PA Bigfoot Encrypted Festival, uh, which is going to be held in Elysburg, Pennsylvania. Where is Elysburg? If you ever heard of Knobles Grove, one of the best uh, free amusement parks in the country. It's right outside of town there. It's a beautiful area. Um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, come on out for the uh, Cryptid Festival and then uh, stick around for Knobles. Knobles is awesome. So I cannot uh, emphasize that enough. That's going to be August 12th, 2023. I will be a speaker there. Um, again, uh, Jeremiah, one of the things I, I'll be talking about isn't so much uh, you know, the the research, I'll, I'll be talking about the research, but I'll be really emphasizing uh, being safe out there in the, in the woods. Uh, because again, uh, you know, the last thing that we want is to, uh, as a first responder, is to be called out for, uh, you know, somebody that's lost or, uh, you know, somebody that, that may have inadvertently gotten hurt or, uh, or worse, you know, out there in the woods while they're doing research. So we really want to try to emphasize, you know, the safety part of it. Um, and that's pretty much it. The one thing I did want to talk about, which we didn't get to, I, I was kind of, I was kind of like teasing you, uh, uh, giving you the teaser about it is I wanted to talk about my Bigfoot movie I went to make. Oh my goodness. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put that, so anyway, put that in here. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, my very, very good friend, Gwen, um, yes. who is from Got Knockers, Great, great person. Um, you know, definitely, uh, you know, follow her and follow Got Knockers. It's a, 
It's a great group. It's Gwendolyn Purcell, right? Gwendolyn Purcell. Yeah. Yes. She is. She is awesome. So anyways, we were out doing a uh, just a small expedition, you know, uh, her and, uh, and uh, one or two other pe- uh, people, I believe they were from they were from that CARC program. Um, and we were outside of Elysburg, which is actually, uh, uh, you know, a pretty mountainous, but it's mountains and farms and uh, throughout that area. So one of the guys that was with us, we heard a rock get thrown. Or I don't know if it was a rock. Could have been an acorn. I don't, I'm not sure. But he had said, hey, why don't we throw the rock back? I said, oh, heck no. Because <laughs> if you got something that could throw a rock whizzing past your face at like 100 miles an hour and you're going to throw a rock back, I don't want to get into a rock battle <laughs> with, with somebody that could throw like that in the dark. So from that, that spawned my idea. So anyways... Seth Breedlove, if you're listening, Bobcat Goldweight, I have you in mind. <laughs> so what I have is Bobcat Goldweight is going to star in my movie, and he's going to be a talent scout for the Major League Baseball. And he needs to get that one more star, or the team is going to drop him. So... Somehow he's driving around, uh, you know, the mountains of Southern California and runs into a Bigfoot. And the Bigfoot runs away from him, starts throwing rocks at him. And he says, hey, you know what? I could get you to play baseball. And somehow this Bigfoot comes back with Bobcat Goldweight. They sign on to the L.A. Dodgers and the Bigfoot ends up uh, (laughs) becoming, uh, you know, the next uh, starting pitcher of the uh, of the world series. The only thing though, is that the only thing though I was thinking about was that in order for that to be successful, they'd have to dim the lights down a little bit. You know, they can't have all those big, bright stadium lights going. Right. Yeah. That's, that's you know, they'd have to dim them down for, (laughs) for a big foot, but you know, you, you got something that would throw like a 150 mile an hour fastball, you know, and I'm sure Bigfoot could probably learn how to throw curveballs and and sliders and everything. So I think that would be the perfect movie for Bobcat Goldweight, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, for uh, for a good Bigfoot movie. But going in and and really quick before I, 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 you know, uh, just kind of in the same I I mentioned about Seth Brady Love. One comment I made on Facebook that I think is going to stand is the STM team, you know, between him, Mm -hmm. Alex, Eli, these guys here are what Patterson and Gilman were back in the sixties. These guys here are going to find, yeah, I, I believe in the next, you know, year or two, they've gotten so close already. They are going to get something on camera. I, 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 you don't doubt it. Um, yeah, the way yeah. that they do things, I've I've watched them. Um, you know, they're they're excellent outdoors people. Um, and uh, Alex is uh, very very impressive with with what he does. Um, and uh, I I think that the way that they put themselves out there, um, and what they do is is amazing. And I do think that. You know, it's going to come down to one of these, uh, uh, one of their documentaries. They're going to get something on film. I, I, I really, really have faith in them. Um, and then also you have the other, other uh, uh, people along with that. Tate, great guy. I, I was telling you before the the show, I saw his uh, series with uh, where he came to Iowa with you, and he was going across the country. It was really, uh, really a, an outstanding uh, program. So. Uh, I think we have a good crop of researchers that are out there doing the right thing. And it really gives me a lot of faith that I think that we're going to have, you know, we're going to have some, some really good evidence in the next uh, year or two. It is really cool. Like uh, in sometimes um, these guys will go out as a group. Uh, You'll have people like Alex will Alex Petikoff, will be doing beyond the trail, but you'll also have, yep. you know, like Tate Hieronymus will be doing his Sasquatch search for Sabi series. Sometimes you'll have Jonathan easily there doing 
Western Bigfoot exploration. You'll have Ron Man Reed doing his thing too. Yes. So because you have all these things going on at the same time, people capturing video. Yes. I agree. There's a there's a huge likelihood that we are uh, very close to finally getting something on uh, camera again, uh, reputably. Yes. <laughs> we'll leave it at yes. that. We're not going to get into that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know what I, I mean. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I I totally agree with you, Matt. It has been a uh, fun time chatting. Uh, I'll have to definitely keep in touch with you, and uh, absolutely, I think you'll be having some some other cool things happen in the future as well. But I hope so. I hope so. So, I again, I thank you so much for uh, for allowing me to be on your show. It has been a pleasure. Um, I've been uh, listening to uh, to your show uh, uh, pretty much from the onset, so uh, it, it was always a great podcast to listen to. In fact, I would go through the Suskin area listening to your podcast. Oh, that's so cool. because I'd have to go up. Uh, we have a yeah. uh, uh, we have a, a place to go to up there for uh, to you know, send out uh, uh, lab stuff, and so I'd always take the back way through the Suskin Road and. Uh, I, it was, uh, your, uh, Bigfoot society was always like number one on my, uh, on my, uh, Apple list. So, uh, it it definitely, definitely had some wonderful shows on there. Cool. Thank you. Well, thanks again for hanging out tonight, Matt. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thank you, uh, Jeremiah. And, uh, and again, uh, thanks to your listeners there. Uh, they've been great. And, uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully you can get me and Sean out here, you know, and, We'd love to to come on and hopefully we'll have some great, great stuff for you over this summer. So thank you for listening to Bigfoot society. Become a supporting member by going to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot society. And if you've got a Bigfoot encounter you'd like to share with me, please send me an email at Bigfoot society at gmail.com. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing Slash to be in your band. Next up for lead guitar. You're in. Cool. (laughs) Yep, even easier than that. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank for details. Capital One and a member FDIC. Did you know that 92% of households that join Peloton early in the year are still active a year later? 92% for a bike? We actually make a rower, too. Who actually knows how to row? Well, our form assist feature can teach you how to row. Cool, huh? Whether it's a scenic row in Mission Bay, San Diego, or an intro to rowing class, Peloton has a class for you. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try the Peloton Row risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Do you like aliens, UFOs, cryptids, and the supernatural? What about self-defecating humor? Uh, actually, it's self-deprecating humor. Well, you may both be right. Alien Theorist Theorizing is a comedy podcast that examines cases like Roswell, Bigfoot, Dyatlov Pass, or the Atacama Alien. Was that that little pickle baby that was found at Chili's? Uh, it was alien remains found in Chile. We also explore the minds of some of the UFO community's best. We talk crop circles with Freddie Silva. And we explore the current state of UFO disclosure. With my man, Richard Dolan. If any of these topics pique your interest, grab a beer and come hang out and theorize with some not-so-sober, like-minded weirdos as we wade through the BS and get inspired by the possibilities. New episodes every Friday. Subscribe to Alien Theorist Theorizing free anywhere you find podcasts or go to alientheorists.com.